Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Friends of the Dar, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Tonight's lecture title, don't worry about that one, look at that one, Stories Without Borders, Following the Tracks of International Folklores. It's fascinating, and at first, a little mysterious. Is it simply an entertainment describing the variations of these tales, their origins, their development, and even their symbolism? Dr. Jamshid Tehrani, a social anthropologist and anthropology professor at the University of Durham in the UK, uses these narratives to illustrate the main focus of his research interests, how culture evolves and how it is transmitted. This concerns the strong continuity evident in the local traditions associated with different cultures. Dr. Tehrani has published extensively on the technical aspects of cultural evolution and transmission, particularly involving folklores as well as weaving traditions. For example, his doctor doctoral thesis dealt with the transmission of craft traditions in Iranian tribal groups. These scholarly investigations are pertinent to the study of Kuwaiti culture. An increasing number of Kuwaiti scholars, writers, some of whom lectured here at the Dar, have taken up the study and analysis of the origins and evaluation of traditional Kuwaiti culture. Among them is Sheikh Al-Taf Salim Al-Ali, also a social anthropologist, her interest in material culture of Kuwait, not only in its description of documentation, but also its role in the evaluation of culture and history. She has resulted, this work has resulted in her devotion to the, to the continuation and resilience of the Sadu Cooperative Society to reinvigorate and promote Bedouin weaving of Kuwait. Much of the documentation of the Sedu weavings was destroyed when the Sedu house was looted in the 1991 period. The house itself was occupied, occupied by Iraqi soldiers and the contents, including the computers, were destroyed. New pictograms of post-91 weaving items have been made, such as those relating to the war, of course, including airplanes, rockets. These have been found. However, to my knowledge, not so for, for mobile phones. This will give you a hint to turn them off, and let's welcome Dr. Jamshid Tehrani. That kind introduction, and uh, thank you to Sheikha Hassa for the invitation, and um, to everybody for making the time to come and listen to my lecture this evening. So I'm going to start my lecture with a little story. It's a story that was first documented around 1700 in China uh, called The Tale of the Tiger Woman. And versions of this story can be found throughout China, Japan, Korea, and other parts of East Asia. And the story goes something like this. Once upon a time, there was a woman who lived in a remote mountain village with three daughters. One day, the woman left her daughters at home to go and visit her mother, who unfortunately 
wasn't feeling very well, so she packed a basket full of some goodies to take to her sick mother and told her daughters, girls, when I'm gone, don't open the door because there's a tiger roaming through these mountains. So she left her daughters and soon after setting off to her mother's house, she encountered the tiger. The tiger came up to her and told the woman that uh, it was hungry. So the woman gave the tiger some of the um, goodies that were in her basket, but unfortunately that didn't satisfy the tiger who was very hungry. And in the end, sadly for the woman, the tiger devoured her, ate her all up. But this tiger was an extremely hungry tiger and it still wasn't satisfied. So it made its way to the house where the three daughters um, were waiting. The tiger knocked on the door, but the girls wouldn't answer because they remembered their mother's instruction. But the tiger, who was a very clever tiger and had found out where the mother had been going, pretended to be their grandmother, put on the voice of an old lady, imitating their grandmother, saying, Granny's come to visit you. And the girls were very confused because they said, but mother's gone to go and visit you. Why, why have you come here, Granny? And the tiger said, well, obviously there's been some kind of mistake because I was supposed to be visiting you. And eventually, the little girls let the tiger into the house. And as soon as the tiger got in the house, the tiger blew out the lantern so that it was pitch black and the girls couldn't see that it wasn't their grandmother and it was actually a tiger. The tiger quickly got into the bed and hid under the covers and said, Granny's very tired. I'm going to go to sleep. Won't you come and give Granny a little cuddle? So the girls got into bed with their Granny and they quickly noticed that something wasn't quite right. Granny, why are your feet so rough? Oh, it's because it's been a long journey. I have blisters on my feet. Granny, why are you so hairy? And the tiger replied, I'm getting old, and when you're old, you know, hairs, you know, they grow in strange places. Granny, what is, the, what is that crunching sound that you're making? To their horror, the two eldest daughters realized that the granny was crunching on, their, on the bones of their youngest sibling. The eldest daughter, who was quite a quick thinker, said, Granny, um, my little sister has to go to the toilet. Will you let us out? And reluctantly, the tiger agreed and the eldest daughter took her younger sister and um, they escaped out into the yard, climbed up a tree where they hid from the tiger and they managed to get away. Okay, so as I said, this is a story that is very well known in, throughout East Asia, but I'm sure that it's also a story that many of you will recognize as well. It is, of course, strikingly similar to the tale of Little Red Riding Hood about a girl who goes to visit her sick grandmother, takes a basket of goodies, encounters a hungry wolf. The wolf gets to the granny's house, eats the grandmother, impersonates the grandmother, and tricks Little Red Riding Hood into getting into the bed where they have a very similar dialogue. Granny, why, is your, why are your eyes so big? Um, and so on, and Little Red Riding Hood gets attacked by the wolf, having been deceived into thinking that the wolf is her grandmother. And we find other very similar stories in other parts of the world as well. So in parts of sub-Saharan Africa, there's a story about two siblings who escape from their father, who is actually an ogre and is trying to eat them. And um, the brother goes out to go and get some food for them and tells his sister, make sure you don't open the door while I'm away. Um, but the father finds out where they're living, impersonates 
The brother tricks his daughter into letting him into the house and eats up the daughter. So we have three stories here that are clearly related to one another and which epitomize something which folklorists call an international tale type. That is, a story that has a recognizably consistent plot in many different cultures, albeit with uh, local variations, like whether it's a tiger or a wolf or an ogre um, that's the villain, and so on. And folklorists have documented a large number of these so-called international tale types, over 2,500, in fact, in more than 300 cultures, that have been catalogued in a remarkable reference called the Arna Thompson Uther Index. And each international tale type is given its own unique catalogue number. So this particular story is ATU, Arna Thompson Uther, number 333, the glutton, or Little Red Riding Hood. Now, for the folklorists that established this typology, um, one of the principal goals of international folktale studies was to um, document all the different variants of these international types, sort them by region and chronology in order to um, reconstruct their pathways of dissemination, their places of origin, and even to try and um, reconstruct the original forms of these stories and track their evolution through time and space. But there are a couple of major issues that these so-called historic geographic folklorists had to contend with. The first one is that most of these international types were defined in relation to a primarily Western corpus of folk tales, um, like the Grimm Brothers collection, for example, which of course is a very famous uh, iconic collection of folk tales. And um, in some cases, it became quite, it, it's quite difficult to apply these international types in a consistent way to folk tale traditions in other parts of the world. And in fact, Little Red Riding Hood is a very good example of this because both the ogre father and the tiger grandmother although clearly resembling Little Red Riding Hood, also have strong similarities with another uh, well-known international tale type, not ATU-333, Little Red Riding Hood, but another one, ATU-123, called The Wolf and the Kids. And in this story, there's a nanny goat who leaves her little goat kids at home to go and forage for some food and tells them not to open the door while she's out, because there's a wolf in the region, and, um, she, and she teaches them a password, not realizing that the wolf has overheard this password, and while she's gone, the wolf comes to the door, impersonates her voice, uh, even you know, puts flour on his paw to put it through the door to prove that he's a, a goat, and the little goat kids let the wolf in, and the wolf um, attacks them and eats them. And this is a story that's related to Little Red Riding Hood, but it, as I said, is a distinct international type in Western folktale traditions. But when we look at these um, African and East Asian stories, it's not completely clear whether they should be considered uh, variants of Little Red Riding Hood or the wolf and the kids, because they've got similarities with both. So on the one hand, they have a human victim, uh, the stories about humans rather than about animals like goats, as in ATU-123. But then on the other hand, when we look at the location of the attack, um, both the ogre father and the tiger grandmother, the attack happens in the um, victim's own house rather than in the grandmother's house, as in ATU-333. So it's not completely clear, as I said, whether we should consider these stories to be one type or another. An even more significant problem is a problem that I call the problem of missing links, that there are just so many missing pieces when we're trying to reconstruct the history of folktale traditions, because after all, 
Folk tales, almost by definition, are primarily transmitted through oral tradition. And so we don't have a very good written record. Um, we don't have a lot of physical evidence for the um, history and development of these traditions because people didn't really start writing folk tales down until the 19th century in most cases. We don't have a very good record. And of course, this means that a lot of these reconstructions of folktale traditions and their international um, links and relationships are quite speculative. So in order to deal with these problems, I've drawn inspiration from a very different field than folklore studies, namely the field of evolutionary biology, which in many ways faces very similar kinds of problems, not least the problem of missing links, because one of the key goals of evolutionary biology is to try and reconstruct the evolutionary relationships among uh, organisms. This is something that we've seen very recently in the case of COVID, for example, of trying to reconstruct the relationships between different variants of um, the COVID, COVID virus. And in some ways, we can think of folktales as being a kind of virus, a virus of the mind. Um, and the way that um, in evolutionary biology that they've gone about trying to uh, reconstruct these relationships and the, the um, evolution of species and organisms has been to use information about the past that's preserved through the mechanism of inheritance. In the case of evolutionary biology, that means shared genetic mutations, sequences of DNA. And we can use these shared genetic mutations um, between different organisms to identify um, how they're related to one another. And this um, set of techniques for doing it is known as phylogenetics. And phylogenetics has been applied in other fields as well, not least in linguistics. So different languages are also related to one another. So here you have an example of um, phylogenetics being applied to reconstruct the relationships between Indo-European languages. So um, you can take different uh, items of vocabulary, different uh, forms of words, in order to identify how closely or distantly related different languages are. So if we take the word father, for example, you can see that in um, uh, the so-called Romance languages of Indo-European, the word for father is very similar in French and Spanish and Italian, padre, padre, pair, as opposed to the word for father in English, um, which is a Germanic language. And we can see this that in the way that father is kind of more similar to uh, German. Um, the German word for father, Vata, or Dutch, another Germanic language, Vata, um, and so on. And we can use the same kinds of principles that biologists use to reconstruct the evolutionary relationships among species to reconstruct family trees for languages, as shown in this example here. So what about in the case of folktales? Well, similarly with folktales, we can take mutations in a story that arise when a story gets told and retold from person to person and from generation to generation and adapts to different local surroundings, different natural contexts and social and cultural contexts. So what kinds of mutations are we talking about uh, when we're talking about stories? Well, we can, using the examples that I've just used, um, you can have a daughter that goes out to visit her grandmother, or a mutation of that might be the mother goes out to visit the grandmother. Could be that the daughter or, or mother is attacked by a wolf or by a tiger, and then there can be other mutations in the plot, like the victim escapes from the monster, is eaten up by the monster, or maybe is eaten up by the monster, but is then later rescued by a passing woodcutter, which is what happens in the famous Brothers Grimm version of Little Red Riding Hood. And we can take these different mutations and then build a family tree for different versions of an international folktale type like Little Red Riding Hood, and in this way we can overcome this problem of missing links and reconstruct the uh, tradition 
using information about the past that's been preserved through this mechanism of inheritance, just as, in other words, we can look at the, at the DNA of stories. So um, to test out this approach, I took a sample of different versions of Little Red Riding Hood and related stories, including the tiger grandmother, the wolf and the kids, and the ogre father, from 33 different populations. I looked at a number, uh, 58 tales in total and analyzed 72 different variations or mutations in the plots of these tales. Um, and I analyzed them using three different methods of phylogenetic analysis, which I won't go into now for the sake of time, but I'm very happy to talk about afterwards in the, uh, when we have questions. And the results of this analysis showed that, um, the, that these techniques actually work really well to reconstruct the history of this tradition and its diversification. There's a strong phylogenetic structure it, that um, accounts for the similarities and differences between these different um, tales that group them into three principal lineages. And I'm just going to briefly talk you through each one of these lineages. So the first lineage consists mainly of European versions of Little Red Riding Hood. Um, and um, reassuringly for this analysis, um, it, these relationships fit well with existing knowledge about the chronology of the story. So we have, as I said, all these missing links, but there are some things that we do know about the history of this tradition. For example, we know that the Brothers Grimm version is of more recent origin than the late 17th century version of Little Red Riding Hood written down by the French fairy tale author Charles Perrault. And we can see this on this lineage that the Brothers Grimm version is, um, the, is a leaf that's, that's you know, one of the real twigs at the end of this branch, whereas the Perrault version looks to be more ancestral. It's closer towards the root of the lineage. We also find interesting evidence of an um, early medieval variant of this story, which um, was recorded in a sermon um, in Belgium by um, Egbert of Liege, um, and this has been proposed to be a, a, a kind of ancestral or, or a precursor of Little Red Riding Hood. And this analysis lends support to that previously uh, unproven theory. Most importantly of all, what this uh, result um, underlines is that the literary versions of Little Red Riding Hood, starting with the, the tradition instigated by Charles Perrault, um, is descended from a, a older European oral tradition. So we find these, all these European oral versions of Little Red Riding Hood are ancestral to the literary tradition. The second major lineage consists of the wolf and the kids, ATU-123. So we get this nice split between ATU-123 and ATU-333. Um, and um, again, we find um, support for the uh, kind of chronological dating of some of these versions. It appears that the wolf and the kids here originated in a, uh, as a fable. So we have these early, around 400 um, common era, in the common era, uh, Aesopic fables that are at the kind of root of this tradition, and then all the kind of more recent oral and literary versions of the story. And what we find is that the African tales that I mentioned earlier of the ogre father clearly cluster with the wolf and the kid. So in other words, the African stories aren't African versions of Little Red Riding Hood. They are African versions of the wolf and the kids, helping to solve that ambiguity. And then finally, we have the third lineage, which consists of these tales of the tiger grandmother. And um, the tiger grandmother isn't, um, can't be considered to be either ATU-333, Little Red Riding Hood, or ATU-123. They represent a separate lineage. And further analysis of this tradition um, shows that they likely evolved through a process of hybridization. In other words, by blending together aspects of Little Red Riding Hood, the wolf and the kids, and local Asian tales. Okay, 
So, um, I guess one of the take-home messages from this is that, yes, we can think of um, folk tales or folk tale motifs as being similar to genes. But if that's the case, then can folk tales be useful as markers of population history in the way that genes are? Now, certainly for the Brothers Grimm, they very much believed that that was the case. So here we have a quote from Wilhelm Grimm, one of the Brothers Grimm, who um, noticed that many of these typical German stories that they recorded when they went out to the, you know, to the, to the villages and, uh, of, of Germany to, re to capture these traditional German stories had clear um, resemblances to stories that had been recorded in Scandinavia, in England, in Eastern Europe, and even as far away as India and Iran. And Grimm speculated, and here's a nice quote, that the outer li outermost lines of this common heritage are coterminous with those of the great race, which is commonly called Indo-Germanic, what we today call Indo-European. And the relationship draws itself in constantly narrowing circles around the settlements of the Germans. So what Grimm means by this is that populations that speak similar languages have got more folktale traditions um, in common with one another. And this is because he believed that language and folklore were co-inherited. They were both part of a kind of common inheritance. Other writers, on the other hand, were, were very skeptical of this theory. So Walter Scott, for example, thought that um, rather than folk tales being passed down from generation to generation um, and reflecting this kind of common inheritance of populations and, and kind of cultural descent, um, actually, it was very easy for stories to pass between populations. He talks about, oh, sorry. He talks about the wide diffusion of popular fictions like fairy tales may be compared to the facility with which straws and feathers are dispersed abroad by the wind. So what um, Scott is getting at here is, is that you've got a, a, a nice folk tale and it's going to catch on. People are going to you know, tell it to their neighbors, and they'll tell it to their neighbors, and soon a story will spread from one village to another. And before long, it spreads across entire countries and entire continents. And this is also a very kind of intuitive idea. Now, a third theory, um, which was promoted by another great folklorist, Andrew Lang, suggests that actually um, it could be that these similarities between different folktale traditions are basically coincidental, or they arise from the fact that the human mind works in similar ways um, all around the world, that they reflect basic kind of universal human fantasies and experiences. So Andrew Lang was very inspired by a visit to the British Museum where he noticed that there were these um, very strong similarities in geometric forms of pots made in the Americas um, and in um, the Mediterranean. And nobody really would suggest that there was a direct connection, whether cultural descent or cultural diffusion um, between Mediterraneans and, um, and indigenous uh, Americans. Um, and he says that we know that similar patterns, similar art, have thus been independently evolved. Is it impossible then that out of similar materials, similar marching, in other words, similar stories, may be independently evolved as well? And then a fourth theory, which has gained um, traction in recent years, is a kind of revisionist theory of fairy tales um, promoted by Ruth Bottingheimer and others that suggests that actually these stories don't reflect any kind of ancient tradition at all, but they're actually fairly recent inventions. They, were, um, they, they actually come from the minds of early modern writers, people like Charles Perrault or Italian fairy tale writers like Basile and, and Straparola in early modern times. And um, these stories became very popular, first as a, in the literary medium, and then they caught on and they were adopted by 
you know, sort of peasants in villages and got sort of eventually corrupted um, and entered into, into oral tradition that way, but they don't have any um, deep history apart, beyond that. So with my colleague, Sarah Grasso de Silva, I set out to test these different uh, theories. Um, and to do that, I used data on Indo-European fairy tales from that ATU index, which I mentioned earlier on, the Arna Thompson Uther index. And um, we used a sample of 275 of these so-called tales of magic, that is fairy tales, from 50 Indo-European societies. So Indo-European is the example I gave earlier of a, of a, la a big language family. Indo-European is, a, is, a, is one of the really major language families that um, stretches all the way from Scandinavia down to um, uh, Iran and India. And there are various different branches to the Indo-European language family. You've got the Romance languages, like French and Italian and Spanish and Portuguese, the Germanic languages, like Danish, Dutch, and German. Um, you've got the Indo-Iranian languages, the Baltic Slavic languages, and so on. All of these being sort of different branches of this um, big Indo-European language tree. And what we wanted to look at was whether, well, to basically test Wilhelm Grimm's theory that um, cultures that are linguistically similar to one another will also have um, a lot of common fairy tales, a lot of common folk tales, um, because both folk tales and languages are part of the same Indo-European inheritance, exactly what Wilhelm Grimm proposed. So to do this, we looked at whether the distributions of these tail types could be predicted by the phylogenetic relationships, the family relationships among Indo-European languages. So to, I'll just give you a, a brief um, walkthrough of how we did this. So here, imagine that this is um, the language tree, and the circles here represent the leaves of that tree, in other words, the surviving populations of the Indo-European language family. And I've um, shaded in here, in these leaves, the shaded ones represent the populations that have a particular folktale, and then the empty circles are the populations that don't have that folktale. So in this particular case, you can see that the distribution, the phylogenetic distribution of this story is very clumped. It can be predicted, the distribution of the story can be predicted by the, relate, the linguistic relationships among um, these particular populations. Closely related languages, um, those cultures will have this story and the other ones don't have the story. Versus a situation where you have a more phylogenetically random distribution for a folktale. So in this case, you can see the language tree doesn't really tell us anything about whether or not a population will have this particular folktale or not. So it's a, 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 um, a statistical test, basically, of um, this correlation between linguistic relatedness and um, the distributions of these folk tales. And what we found was that about 100 of the 275 tales we looked at had this um, statistically significant phylogenetic signal consistent with Wilhelm Grimm's hypothesis. But we have to be a little bit cautious about getting too excited about a result like that because um, la populations that speak closely related languages tend to also be close um, geographic neighbors to one another. So if you look at a, an example like, um, say, um, Spain and Portugal, they're both nearest phylogenetic relatives, Spanish and Portuguese are very closely related languages, but they're also spatially very close together. So it could be that, that this is a false signal, that what looks like an example of cultural descent could just be an example of what Walter Scott called the you know, diffusion of stories you know, like feathers on the wind, that it's just spread from Portugal to Spain or the other way around, and that it's not something that goes back to some common ancestor of the Spanish and Portuguese. So we used another method, um, an autologistic model, um, which uh, directly compared the effects of linguistic descent 
and um, spatial proximity in um, predicting the distributions of these folktales. So here you can see a case where this is the same folktale. Um, here it's been fitted to a language model, and here it's been fitted to a spatial model. And in this particular case, you can see that the language model is a better predictor than the spatial model. It's kind of quite randomly distributed on this spatial neighbor graph, whereas it's captured very nicely on the language tree. Versus a situation like this, where you can see that space is a better predictor, spatial relationships are better predictors um, of the distribution of the story than linguistic relationships are. And what we found is that um, for those stories that had this um, statistically significant signal um, of um, phylogenetic uh, descent, that um, the vast majority of those, in fact, over three quarters, um, linguistic relatedness is a better model than spatial proximity. So that's a pretty um, large proportion of tales that even when you can control for geographic relationships, it looks like that we can see these enduring signatures of language folktale co-inheritance. So really exactly what Wilhelm Grimm predicted. Of course, um, with the caveat that we started with 275, we're, we're down to 76. But that's still quite a large proportion of the tales that we looked at. And I think most people wouldn't expect stories to um, survive for, for as long as this analysis suggests. And what we were able to do with those 76 was then to map them onto our Indo-European language tree and trace them back through time to common ancestral populations. And by doing this, we, we found um, a, a large number of stories, over 35, that could be traced back to the common ancestors of the major Indo-European subfamilies, like um, Romance. In other words, this is like Latin or the, the, uh, the Roman period, or Proto-Germanic, Proto-Balto-Slavic, and so on. And these um, tales included some of the most famous fairy tales that we know today, like Beauty and the Beast. And this was first, the first earliest literary versions of this go back to 1740. But clearly the story, well, I mean, according to our results, um, is far older than that. We traced it back to the um, last common ancestor of Western Indo-European um, populations that takes it back to, to around 4,000 years ago or even older. Um, and another very famous story that's of a similar age in our analysis Rumpelstiltskin, ATU 500, the name of the supernatural helper, which we find literary versions of since 1634. Um, some um, tantalizing evidence that it may have existed in Roman times, but we are able to trace it back much further. And then most excitingly of all for us, we were able to trace one story back to the last common ancestor of all surviving Indo-European people, so-called Proto-Indo-European, um, so some five to 6,000 years ago, and this is the story known as The Smith and the Devil, ATU 300, and this tells of a blacksmith who makes a deal with the devil where he agrees to sell his soul to the devil in return for the power to weld any materials together. And the first thing he does when the devil gives him this power is he sticks the devil to the spot and won't release him until the devil um, lets him off his side of the bargain. So he manages to, to trick the devil. And this is a story that we find in many different parts of the Indo-European world and which survives in many um, forms today as well. And this appears to be the oldest Indo-European folktale. Now, clearly, um, what these results suggest is that far from folk tales being inventions of early modern writers, that they go back way further. In fact, according to these analyses, they go back before the invention of writing itself. And this raises, I think, some really fascinating questions, which are um, questions that I want to reflect on um, briefly just at the end of this um, lecture which is how is it possible for folktales to endure for this length of time? How can they survive without the support of written text, just through oral transmission alone? 
how is it possible for some of these international types to spread across entire continents and catch on in so many different cultures, transcending differences in environments and languages and social systems? And I think that there are some interesting um, and um, promising leads uh, to answer these questions from cognitive science that suggests that very stable and successful stories are the ones that are able to exploit some of the kind of basic and universal aspects of the human mind or the way our minds work. So not all information uh, is of similar, is similarly catchy, right? So there are some things that you know that you know, we find much easier to remember and pass on than other kinds of information. And there have been some fascinating psychological experiments exploring this that are essentially based on the children's game telephone, which many of you may have played when you're younger, where one person tells the next person something, and then that person tells that story or, or piece of information to the next person. And I'm sure if you've played that game, you'll remember that very quickly, the story or the information will get distorted and break down very rapidly. And what um, I've done with various other colleagues is um, we've um, taken this kind of model, this kind of, of this children's game, if you like, and um, looked at what kinds of stories are the catchiest when you, or, or the most stable when you pass them along in these artificially generated um, experimental traditions. And it appears that there are several different content biases. And I should say that this isn't just my own work, but there have been a lot of really interesting experiments in this area. So what are some of these content biases? In other words, the kinds of properties that really help to stabilize a story. Well, one really important one seems to be a bias for counterintuitive concepts. So that is concepts that aren't just surprising, but concepts that violate our basic expectations of um, the properties of physical things, of living kinds, and of human minds. So, for example, something like a flying carpet. We know that like, objects can't be animated, they can't take off, they can't fly. Um, an animal that can change into different species, a shape-shifting animal, or even turn into... A human, again, this, is a count, this violates our intuitions about the properties of living kinds. Animals can't do that. Um, or a person that can see into the future. We know that human minds aren't capable of, of doing that kind of thing. We can only know things that we have direct experience of or that we've seen or that we've heard about. Certainly not things in the future. And it appears that stories that exploit this kind of um, um, property of counterintuitiveness are really effective at grabbing our attention and are really memorable and, and we're very good at passing on those kinds of stories. Another bias is a bias for survival relevant information. So information, for example, about um, predators, about dangers, about hazards in our environment. And of course the human mind is very well tuned to that kind of information because our survival depends on being good at, at um, remembering that information and passing it on. And similarly, social information. So this is information about things like family relationships, about reciprocity and interactions, about deception and betrayal. And again, we're a very social species. So it stands to reason that our brains are going to be good at processing social information. And last of all, emotional arousal is also something that seems to be an important property of memorable um, and highly transmissible stories. So stories that amuse us, that excite us, or that inspire terror um, are just more kind of interesting and memorable than stories that we don't emotionally engage with. And if we just return then to the story that I began this lecture with, the tiger grandmother or Little Red Riding Hood, we can see that all of these ingredients are part of those stories. So you have counterintuitive properties, like, for example, um, an animal that can talk. We've got um, the emotional arousal of the stories, the kind of amusement, but also the terror 
of um, the imminent attack of the victim by the predator. Survival information, we have uh, an ecologically salient predator, whether that's a wolf in, in um, Europe or the Middle East, or a tiger in um, East Asia. And, um, and of course, these various different elements all combine to make a very powerful metaphor about um, our sociality, about, you know, so in other words, the sort of social information component that um, people are not always what they seem. Um, you know, be careful of, of strangers or people pretending to be that which they're not. And if you think then about stories that are built of such powerful materials as these, perhaps it's not so surprising that they appear to be so able to stand the test of time. And on that note, I will end. Thank you very much.